Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to continue my series of deep dives on different chapters in Reality Transurfing, the book by Vadim Zeeland, a fascinating book that discusses how to interact and choose your own reality. I definitely recommend previous episodes of The Reality Revolution if you'd like a further in-depth look at this book, which is what we're doing here. Today, we're going to go over the chapter, chapter 9, The Heart and Mind. And when you just see the name on the chapter, oh, that may sound kind of boring and cliche, but it's not. There's some very critical information that's in this. Before I got into transurfing, but was well into Law of Attraction, and I had met a coach that said she could get her clients to accomplish pretty much anything as long as they had a mutual agreement between their heart and mind. And so I had started integrating a lot of this into my own meditations and my own daily practice, really focusing in on my heart. Your heart can be attuned to your feelings and can be an important part of the way you maneuver through the world. If this is the first time that you're listening to the reality revolution, what we're talking about is the creation of reality through your own thoughts and choices. And this has been a topic that obviously has been discussed all the way thousands and thousands of years ago. Every major religion has versions of this idea. But as we have gained new understandings of physics and research, we're gaining a greater understanding of the power of our mind to create reality. I highly recommend reading anything by Dr. Joe Dispenza or Lynn McTaggart in her book, The Intention Experiment. Dr. Dispenza is constantly researching heart coherence. When the heart becomes coherent with the mind, they can literally see it. They can see a scan of it. People have done meditations with feedback machines that show that there's a point where the heart becomes into coherence. It's a brainwave state. And so when this happens, as Vadim Zeeland says, outer intention becomes possible. That's when magical things start to happen. When you start to see outward changes in your reality that sound like miracles. What is happening is your heart is becoming coordinated with your mind. But there's a lot of delicacy to this. And there's a lot of understandings to to this. So I would love to create a meditation that can really unify my heart and mind. And so we're going to do this deep dive. I'm going to read some sections from this chapter, and we're going to see if we can utilize this knowledge and perhaps what we've learned in the common era through science and research done by the Heart Math Institute on how to actually coordinate the heart and mind. Because there's something very special here, and it seems simplistic, but a lot of people out there that are trying to manifest or find or realities or to accomplish goals, just as simple as accomplish goals. Let me just ask you a question. If you're trying to accomplish a goal that you've been working on for a while and you're struggling with it, is your heart in sync with this goal? Ask yourself, you know the truth. You almost know instantaneously. If you're searching for a goal that some pendulum wants you to search for or your parents that's not aligned with you and your heart, you may, you may fight upstream to achieve this goal. You may be able to achieve the goal. I'm not saying you won't, but I'm saying that when you align something with your heart, it goes beyond just achieving the goal. And when, you are, when your heart is linked to it, it is incredible what kind of things can be accomplished. So the chapter begins with with the quote, the soul comes into the world reaching out trustingly with a child's arms. And the first section is the wind of intention. Everyone is born an individual, unique creature that later develops a personality. Thoughts, knowledge, convictions, habits, even character gradually build up like layers of plaque. These parts of the self obviously do not come out of nowhere and yet what is there of us originally could we all really have begun as a completely clean sheet just try for a moment being a completely clean sheet 
and maybe this is a Russian translation, clean sheep, clean slate is what is more commonly used in English, a clean slate or tabula rasa. But just try for a moment being a completely clean sheet. Close your eyes and stop the mental chatter. If you contemplate the blackness, you will manage not to think for a very short period of time. For a moment, your mind will be completely empty and yet you do not stop being yourself in this moment. The activity of the mind is temporarily halted, but a sense of the integrity of the self remains. How do you explain that you are in fact you? An awareness of personal identity usually comes from one's position in society. Yet imagine for a moment that the social environment has disappeared and that you are just hanging in the empty space of the cosmos. There is no earth, no sun, no past, and no future. Just black emptiness. Everything else has disappeared. All that remains is you. So what of your former personality? All knowledge and thoughts, manners, habits, desires, fears, character and pursuits were dependent on your previous environment. What would remain of the self? If you get a chance, check out my void meditation and I developed this with Dr. Joe Dispenza's Void Meditation. I also include this concept in many of my meditations. But there's something very powerful when you do this activity and this exercise of going into the blackness, into the void. You start to understand all the little things you bring into your, into your thought process. It's very powerful. And I believe he's talking about that right there. It is difficult to discuss this question within the framework of reason and yet a discussion on the eternal theme of the existence of the soul goes beyond the scope and purpose of transurfing. He's talking about the question, what would remain of the self? It would also take up a lot of time and lead to nothing. Neither is the issue of the existence of the human soul of particular importance to the aims of transurfing. So people that are exploring the ideas of your own human soul or if your soul is individuated or not, you can continue exploring that. That's not really discussed in Transurfing. It may suit you to believe in the soul or, as you might prefer to call it, the subconscious. You may or may not agree with the concept of the eternal nature of the soul. But it is inarguable that the human psyche consists of the conscious and the unconscious. We previously agreed that all conscious experience would be referred to as the mind and all unconscious experience as related to the heart or soul. For the sake of simplicity and the practical purposes, we need only to draw a rough distinction between the heart and the mind by suggesting that feelings relate to the former and thoughts to the latter. States of elation, openness and inspiration as well as oppression and depression depend on the inner feelings of the heart. So when we talk about recreating feelings or that your feelings are the secret as in Neville Goddard, Zeeland is saying that the heart is the key to that. They depend on the inner feelings of the heart. The mind is entirely in the power of pendulums, which impose limiting perceptions and beliefs. The extent of human freedom is narrowed to what pendulums will permit. This may explain why people tend to identify their position in the world mistakenly 
as servant or master? From the point of view of transurfing, neither of these positions is correct. For man is nothing more than a drop that flies in from the ocean for a brief moment. One of my favorite references in this book, and it's a wonderful idea. I love the idea that we're all like a drop. And even if we form in a cloud, we at some point came from the ocean and we're going back to the ocean. I just imagine our whole lives are just basically the fall of that drop. Imagine if our lives in the terms of the universe is nothing more than a single drop coming down from a cloud into the ocean. And then when we land, we just move right back into it. Sea spray that forms when an ocean wave crashes serves as a good illustration of birth and death. A drop of spray that has become separated from the waves cannot experience oneness with the ocean or receive energy from it. The individual drop of spray thinks that it exists separately and has nothing in common with the ocean until such time as it falls back into the waters and its awareness of oneness is restored. At this point, the drop merges with the ocean into a single whole. For in essence, they are made up of the same element, water. An individual particle of water can take various forms. It can be a drop, a snowflake, an icicle, or a cloud of steam. The form differs, but the essence is the same. The particle does not remember that it is the same as the ocean. It believes that it exists in the form of a drop, a snowflake, or a cloud of steam, and that the ocean is made up of waves, foam, spray, icebergs, currents, and calm. It is very difficult for the particle to see the common essence inherent in all these external manifestations of water. Despite being familiar, the essential com communality remains elusive. Biblical texts on the subject reveal the truth colored by the distortion of the mind. The statement that God created man in his image and likeness is true. Only this truth is normally distorted. God can take any form, but his essence does not lie in the fact that he has a head, two hands, and two feet. If you compare God with the ocean and the individual with the drop, both have the same essence, which is water. According to the testimony of people who have had near-death experiences, when death is close by the soul, experiences an inexplicable serenity and bliss that comes from a feeling of oneness with the cosmos. In a sense, the drop has returned to the ocean and rediscovered the awareness of its true essence knowing that it consists of the same substance as the ocean. In the moment the entire energy of the ocean passes through the drop. Throughout the history of human civilization, man has always sought a feeling of connectedness with the universe. In pursuit of spiritual perfection, all religious schools have ultimately striven for the same goal of reaching enlightenment, of experiencing a sense of oneness with the world, of dissolving into the ocean of energy, losing awareness of the self as a separate essence. And there's so much to unpack here that he has said. It is amazing. 
Have any of you spoken with anybody that had a near-death experience and had that feeling, that feeling of oneness? It is common in in many of the near-death experiences that I've read. An enlightened master has all the energy of the universe at their disposal. They see no fundamental difference between themselves and infinity. Their thought energy enters into resonance with the energy of the ocean. Then, the intention of the enlightened becomes identical to outer intention. Now, he has that in italics. The intention of the enlightened becomes identical to outer intention. The powerful and unfathomable force that rules the world. Understand when Zeeland says outer intention, he that, that means it's a big deal. He's emphasizing that that's when crazy things happen on the outside, when you really see major changes in the outside of your reality, not your inside. And that's what we're most interested in. So I'm always keying in when Zeeland says outer intention. He says when a kite is the right shape, it will climb up through the airstream in the same way The wind of outer intention lifts a person up and carries them through the field to a sector that corresponds to the quality of their thought energy. In order to travel purposely through the space, you have to be able to feel the wind of outer intention as clearly as you feel currents of air or water. Until a person becomes conscious of their essence, and the nature of their oneness with the ocean. The workings of outer intention will be beyond their grasp. We're not going to set ourselves the task of achieving, of reaching enlightenment, for this would be too hard a task. And it's true. The process of actually reaching enlightenment commonly can take years, 40, 50 years in many cases. It's happening faster and faster. But in any case, it is not essential to the realization of your goals. And so if you're interested in reality transurfing for enlightenment, you're probably not going to get it. But if you want to achieve personal goals, this is, to me, the best model in order to do that. There's lots of different ones. You do not have to hide away in Tibet and meditate. Transurfing provides a loophole which allows you to compel outer intention to your personal will to a small degree, perhaps, but nonetheless enough for you to fulfill your desires. So transurfing gives us a loophole to see crazy things happen on the outside. That's a pretty amazing statement by Zealand. Is it true? Have you successfully started to see outer intention realized? I'd love to hear and read your comments on this video or this podcast of when you've seen outer intention changed. I certainly have, but it's not like we get a symbol or a sign that says, okay, right here, this was outer intention. A lot of times we're interpreting events and so i would love to hear your impressions of when you see outer intention taking shape until a person becomes conscious of their essence and the nature of their oneness with the ocean the workings of outer intention will be beyond their grasp so i think this is important in terms of this meditation that I want to create uh, as a separate episode based on this. And that is the idea that when until a person becomes conscious of their essence and the nature of their oneness with the ocean, the workings of outer intention will be beyond the grass. The nature of their oneness 
So let's, how can we do that? Let's see if we can find out further on. We are not going to set ourselves the task of reaching enlightenment for this would be too hard a task. And in any case, it is not essential to the realization of your personal goals. The principle of the loophole, when he says the loophole that transurfing provides for outer intention, the principle of the loophole is relatively simple. The mind has will but is not capable of ruling outer intention. The heart, on the other hand, can experience oneness with outer intention, but has no will, flying through the alternative space like an uncontrolled kite. So imagine our heart is just flying through alternative space without a string, just floating along. Now the next line is in italics, achieving unity between heart and mind is enough to bring outer intention under the sway of your will. So if you've listened to other episodes of the reality revolution, if you've read this book before, or if you've been following, this is chapter nine. And we've dealt with a lot of different concepts though we've talked about. Uh, all the space of variations, the wave of fortune, pendulums. We've talked about, in particular, using intention and lucid dreaming and a lot of crazy things. But the key to it all, if you want to make a big personal change in your life, is this link between the heart and mind. And it seems kind of simple and cliche, but it's very true. The mind has the will, but is not capable. It has no power. So if we can connect to our heart, that's where the magic is. Achieving unity between heart and mind is enough to bring outer intention under the sway of your will. Creating a harmonious connection between heart and mind is difficult, but nonetheless, realistically achievable task. As I stated earlier, the effect of outer intention is quite tangible when it comes to working against the will of the conscious mind and materializing our worst expectations. What we need to do now is understand how our best expectations can also be realized. In in the last chapter that I went over in the deep dive on intention, if you remember that, we defined the key condition for mastering outer intention as awareness, reducing importance, and letting go of the goal. There, with this, you will discover new secrets of transurfing, which open more doors onto the mysterious world of outer intention. All right, well, sign me up because I want to change the mysterious world of outer intention. So the next section is the heart sale. People generally tend to interpret themselves and other physical phenomena in the world as essentially material objects. Yet all material objects have one informational and energetic essence in common, which defies conventional perception. It is the essence that directs the behavior of material realization in the alternative space. The language of abstract symbols we are used to referring to is only sufficient to describe the outer manifestations of this informational and energetic essence. The original essence itself cannot be unambiguously described using the language of the mind. Hence, the magnitude of philosophical and religious movements that have attempted to do so. Human perception is like this because we have been taught since early childhood to concentrate our attention on separate elements. Look at Lialia, he says. These are your hands and these are your feet. 
and this is your porridge look at the bird so he's making an example of early childhood attempts to concentrate different elements our perception continues to be shaped and conditioned throughout our entire life and so the mind constantly channels data according to an established template of how the world is described for example if someone has never seen another person's energy field the mind will be reluctant for the eyes to perceive it because it is not consistent with the established template in childhood no one ever drew our attention to auras and so they were excluded from the template we use to describe the world now we understand theoretically that the aura exists but our ability to perceive it visually is poorly developed can you see an aura is there anybody out there that sees an aura with everybody all the time have you ever trained yourself to see an aura it's pretty amazing when you really start to work on it to look at auras I can see auras when I when I try when I attempt I don't see them on a regular basis and one of the craziest auras that I've ever seen was Esther Hicks when I was watching with Abraham because it was a pool of energy it was it was definitely very specific very powerful when I saw that but has anybody seen an aura and is it possible what what he's saying in here is that everybody should be seeing auras but we are hypnotized at birth not to in childhood we're taught that hey this template and so it literally changed our template I mean who knows maybe we can fly but we've been we've been placed into a template where we can't the mechanism of perception still remains a puzzle our current understanding is such that only certain elements of it can be discussed with any clarity ants for example have never seen the stars they've never seen the Sun mountains or even the forest their vision is designed so that from birth they only focus on objects that lie in close proximity an ants perception of the world differs radically from our own and I love to think about stuff like that because really all we are is just ants and we would not know mountains or anything like that when we ask what does the world really look like we are attempting to pose an objective question in the hope of receiving an objective answer but the question is not really objective the world looks just as we see it because the notion looks like is also an element of the template that colors our perception in the template of a blind mole for example the notion looks like simply does not exist the world demonstrates itself to us in accordance with our template of perception and the same time the world does not actually look like anything there is no point in claiming that the world looks as it always has done or it looks like an accumulation of illuminated energy or anything else there is only any point to speaking of the individual manifestation of reality that we are capable of perceiving consciousness is a product of human society and emerges from the concepts and definitions that surround us whereas the soul and he always puts in parentheses subconscious probably for people that are worried that has religious connotations and you can embrace the ideas in reality transurfing without having any sort of belief in God when he says the soul or the subconscious is part of man from birth consciousness is acquired as the surrounding world becomes defined by ideas and definitions in terms of human language now to go back what I was saying can you can you use reality transurfing and not believe in God I I think you can he is making comments that explain what God is if you listen carefully but to apply these principles is possible and very effective 
going on from what I was saying, the world does not only exist because people have described it using their own concepts. In this sense, the human soul will always be illiterate for it does not understand the human language of words. The heart is only capable of understanding the things we call feelings. First a thought emerges and then only afterwards is it formulated in words. You do not have to have words to think. Thoughts are primary, not words. And thoughts are the language of the subconscious can understand. There is no point in trying to communicate with the subconscious in the language of the intellect. And he puts that in parentheses. So this goes back to Neville Goddard. When he wrote the book, The Feeling is the Secret, he was on to this concept that the heart and mind need to be linked together and that the heart understands feelings. And when you sit and feel, you broadcast out the feeling and your heart understands that and your heart is what's communicating outer intention. So that's why the the feeling is so important. The existing set of concepts society uses is far from sufficient to express the entirety of human experience. As you can see, I was not able to fully describe the nature of outer intention. Fortunately, humanity has preserved one means of universal expression through art. We do not need words in order to understand works of art. Everyone can understand the language of the heart. This is the language of things created with love and passion. When a person walks towards their innermost dream through the right door, i.e. does the thing that suits their soul the best, they become capable of creating a masterpiece. And this is how art is born. You can graduate from a conservatory and compose colorless music that no one remembers. And you can paint empty paintings that are technically immaculate, but no one would proclaim them a masterpiece. Yet, if you can say of a created work that it has something, then it can at least be considered a work of art. What specifically that something is, the critics will explain. But one thing is certain, that something can be understood by all without words. The Mona Lisa's smile speaks in a language everyone can understand. There are no words. Words fall short of expressing the things we understand instinctively. What exactly is being comprehended is not important as everyone has their own unique way of divining and feeling. You could, of course, explain that the Mona Lisa's smile is mysterious or that it has an elusive quality, but words are still powerless to explain that special something that makes the painting nothing less than a masterpiece. It's not just the elusive quality of the Mona Lisa's smile that evokes such avid interest. Have you ever noticed the Mona Lisa's smile is similar to the Buddha's smile? People say the Buddha achieved enlightenment during his own lifetime. In other words, people say that Buddha, like the droplet of water, experienced a sense of oneness with the entire ocean. In all the pictures of the Buddha, his smile is totally dispassionate and at the same time expresses serenity and bliss. It is a smile that can be characterized as an expression of the contemplation of eternity. When you see the Buddha's smile for the first time, it evokes a strange mixture of bewilderment and curiosity because it reminds you of a drop of something distant and forgotten. The feeling of oneness with the ocean. Any reminder of this distant oneness touches a chord in the heart. When human language emerged, the language of the soul gradually began to atrophy. People focused too exclusively on the language of the mind, and so with time it began to take primary position in our experience. Even the story that explains how this occurred is told in the context 
of an intellectual concept. A distortion of the process is described in the legend of the Tower of Babel, in accordance with which the gods became angry with man for failing to construct a building that reached the height of the heavens, and so they confounded the languages of man so that the people would no longer be able to understand one another. In essence, the majority of myths and legends express a truth which has been interpreted via mental constructs. Perhaps the high tower serves as a metaphor for the power the people received when they learned to express their will consciously in the language of the mind. As we have said already, the heart can feel the wind of outer intention, but is not capable of putting up a sail to harness the wind's force. The will of the mind, however, can put up a sail. Will is an attribute of conscious awareness. The subconscious flight of the heart on the winds of outer intention is a spontaneous and uncontrolled, whereas conscious awareness allows personal will to be expressed deliberately. Initially, before the languages of the heart and mind become so divorced from one another, harmonious connection between heart and mind was easily achieved. Later, the mind focused so intently on constructing a worldview based on its own references that its knowledge of outer intention was left far behind. Due to colossal intellectual effort, the mind has achieved outstanding success in the technotronomical world of material realization. I will look that up. All right, I've returned. I've looked up technotronical, and there is no definition on Google of that word. I believe it's a word that's specifically used for, for transurfing. So again, the sentence is, due to colossal intellectual effort, the mind has achieved outstanding success in the technotronical world of material realization, but has lost connection with everything that is in any way related to the unrealized alternative space. It is because the mind has radically distanced itself from an understanding of our outer intention that so many ideas within the transurfing model seem implausible. The mind can retrieve the knowledge that has been lost, but in order to do so, there must be a connection between the heart and the mind. The difficulty is that the heart, unlike the mind, does not think. It knows. It already knows. It doesn't sit and ponder. While the mind considers the information it receives passing it through the analytical filter of the template worldview, the heart receives the knowledge from the information field directly. Without subjecting it to analysis, and communicates with outer intention in the same manner. In order to make this communication more focused, there has to be agreement between the will of the mind and the strivings of the heart. Union between heart and mind is essential. If you can achieve this connection, your heart's sail will fill up with wind of outer intention and carry you directly to your goal. So we definitely want to connect the heart and mind. Obviously, this is a big deal, and he's giving us some of the secrets in this. And as I said in the beginning, I think that we're still constantly researching this. The Heart Math Institute, Dr. Joe. But his perspective is very interesting, and it definitely elucidates the importance of of focusing on your heart and feelings when you're going about the process of choosing your reality. The next section is called The Wizard Within. Your heart has everything you need to know to realize your desires. Do you remember the story about the Wizard of Oz? The clever tin man dreams of having a brain, the kind scarecrow 
longs for a heart. The brave lion strives to acquire courage and the girl wants to go home. All the characters already have the, the things they desire. But if, good, if the wizard tells them so, it will sound too implausible to be true. And so he creates a magical ritual instead. In reality, all that was needed was for the Tin Man, Scarecrow, and Lion to give themselves permission to have the qualities they so desired because they already existed in their soul. This is another time that Zeeland uses the term, give yourself permission. He used it earlier in another chapter when he was talking about how oligarchs in Russia became rich by giving that gave themselves permission and so it's the second time i think it's important and have you given yourself permission as we have already said not everything that is connected without our intention fits into the framework of the concept of the mind the mind is responsible for this scenario Pendulums also assisted in the process because freedom and individual control over outer intention would have severely undermined the pendulum's interest. The pendulum monsters only benefit from people who do not stand out in any way and are content to work for them as a cog in a wheel. The realization of individual potential is a pernicious threat to the pendulum because as an individual who is free works for their own development and prosperity. Hence, from childhood we are instilled with conditioned standards and rules which conveniently mold us into obedient adherence. On the one hand, there is a positive need to teach individuals certain rules that will help them to get along in life as the people who break these rules become losers or outcasts. On the other hand, social conditioning strongly suppresses a person's unique individuality and so people generally cannot say what they really want and have no idea of their true capabilities. If you want to suppress a person's ability to master outer intention, It is enough to break the heart's connections with the mind. Throughout the history of humanity, huge efforts have been made to divorce the heart from the mind. The mind has worked constantly to perfect its language of symbols, at the same time becoming ever less practiced in the language of the heart. Pendulums of religion, like pendulums of science, have pulled the mind in different directions as far as possible from the true nature of the heart and finally the development of the in, of industrial and information technologies witnessed over recent centuries has dissolved the connection altogether the influence of pendulums is particularly great at the present time because everyone is now reading books, listening to radio, watching television, and accessing information via the internet. Humanity has absorbed a huge volume of knowledge and equally as much delusion, which holds just as steadfastly in the psyche. The separation of heart and mind is humanity's greatest loss. Wow, and it's true. Humanity's greatest loss. Do you believe so? I think it is. The idea that real success, be it in business, science, art, sport, or any other sphere, can only be achieved by a few individuals is widely accepted as the normal state of affairs. Nobody seems to question it or consider it abnormal. There is no point in you and I trying to save humanity. I simply wish to suggest that you, dear pilgrim, ask yourself the following question. Why him or her and not me? What do I have to do 
to become one of the chosen few. I am no Wizard of Oz and so cannot create magic rituals for you. I will simply answer the question directly. You already have everything you need. All you have to do is use it. You are capable of anything. It is just that no one has told this yet. That was in, in italics and I want to read it again. And it's important for you to go along and get this message. You already have everything you need. All you have to do is use it. You're capable of anything. It is just that no one has told you this yet. You are capable of creating incredible works of art, making unique discoveries, achieving phenomenal results in sport, business, and any other profession. All you have to do is turn your heart, turn to your heart, for the heart has access to all knowledge as well as the previous achievements of all humanity. You just have not asked your heart yet. All great geniuses of art, science, and business have only succeeded in creating masterpiece because they turned to their hearts. What makes your heart any worse than theirs? Nothing. All masterpieces speak to us in the language of the heart. Whatever you do your work will only create an impression of it becomes from the heart. The mind can build a new house using bricks from a previous model, but no one will be astounded by the new design. The mind can make a perfect copy, but only the heart is capable of an original. All you have to do is accept the axiom that the heart has everything it needs and then give yourself the joy of making the most of it. It is incredibly simple and at the same time totally incomprehensible and still you can allow yourself the luxury of having. The will to have depends on you alone. You can do anything. The reader may doubt what I claim to be true or the listener and yet we rarely experience doubt when we are persuaded that we lack the necessary caliber, ability, and quality, or that we are not as worthy or as talented as others. We easily believe that statements that erect high walls on the path to our goals. So do yourself a favor and embrace the knowing that you are a worthy and do deserve the absolute best and are capable of achieving whatever you desire with all your heart. The fact that everyone is worthy of the best and capable of anything is meticulously hidden from us. We are told we are native or naive to believe we have unlimited capabilities. But the opposite is true. Wake up and shake off the delusion. You can dictate the rules of the game if you consciously exercise your rights. No one can forbid you from trying, but the conventional worldview and pendulums will try to convince you in every way possible that your goal is unattainable. There will be all kinds of reasonable arguments put forward to prove that your capabilities are limited. Ignore these arguments and shield yourself with the unreasonable and frivolous conviction that together your heart and mind are capable of anything. After all, you have nothing to lose for what have you really achieved living within the framework of those other very reasonable arguments. So he's saying it doesn't have to be reasonable and he puts into in parentheses earlier on that it's unlikely and makes fun of it the idea that we say these things are are not possible it doesn't have to be likely you have only one life is it not time to shake up the pile of commonly held beliefs what if they turn out to be false and you never have known 
Do it now. Otherwise, you will not have time to find out whether they are true or not. Life will pass you by. All the possibilities will have been exhausted. And the gifts of this miraculous life given to others. And perhaps indeed, they will only be given to a few. But nonetheless, they will not come to you. Only you can decide whether you want to fully exercise your rights or not. If you can allow yourself to have something, you will achieve it. Begin by believing in the unlimited possibilities of the heart and then turning your mind around to face it. False beliefs make this more difficult to do, but the transurfing model helps to deconstruct many erroneous ideas. One of these beliefs stands as follows. It is hardest of all to overcome the self, or it is hardest of all to battle with the self, or the predatory Russian saying, you have to be able to stamp on the throat of your own song, i.e. sacrifice your own desires and act in the interest of others. This is one of humanity's greatest delusions. How can one possibly battle with the amazingly beautiful creatures that lives within you? And what would be the point? Negativity does not live within. It lies on the surface like a layer of dust on the surface of a painting. If you wipe the dust away, a pure heart is revealed underneath. The creature that hides behind many different masks and costumes is imbued with truly wonderful qualities. The task is to allow yourself to be you. Surely the masks you wear are not capable of achieving success, abundance, and happiness. It is futile to try and change yourself because all you do is create another mask. If you remove the masks destructive pendulums force us to wear, you will reveal the treasure that is hidden in your heart. You really do deserve the best because you really are an amazing, unique, and special being. Just allow yourself to be so. If you admire the geniuses of the art world, science, or cinema, know that you too can join their ranks. The reason the work of a genius appeals to you so much is because these creative works are born of the heart. What you choose to create will please others just the same as long as it originates from the uniqueness of your soul. Everything that is ordinary and mediocre is created by the mind. There is nothing unsurpassable about the mind or its creations. You carry a real treasure within you, for the heart is unique. Only the heart can produce an ingenious creation. Make sure the mind allows it to do so. The next section is Mirage. All their lives people are forced to believe that success, wealth, and fame only befall the chosen few. At university and tournaments, competitions, and similar events, people are constantly made to understand that they are far from perfect and that other people are better and more deserving than they are. The ones who achieve success, wealth, and fame in abundance are the ones who do not buy into the deception. It is that simple. It might be difficult to believe that everyone deserves these things and is capable of achieving them, but you can begin to believe it if this is your intention. Many people dream of becoming a star and achieving huge success and the general standards for success are actively and widely promoted. The pendulums 
love to demonstrate the achievements of their favorites to the silent majority. They introduce their favorites as an example of the success we should all strive for if we want to reap the full range of benefits life has to offer. A star has everything the life can give swimming in the rays of wealth and fame. Who would not want to be rich and famous? Even if you do not particularly want to be a huge success and are not the type that hankers after material luxury, you probably would not turn down the chance of material well-being and fulfillment from personal achievement. Stars are born independently, but they are lit up by pendulums. By this, I mean that star worship is intentionally set up and flourishes thanks to the pendulums. In films, on stage, in stadiums, and on TV, we are constantly being shown the society's best representatives, the chosen ones. The way the fans greet the stars with such ravish admiration is always emphasized, and we cannot but see how incredible they are and how phenomenal their achievements are. The same immutable fact is always being instilled. Everyone loves the stars and we must strive to be like them. What aim are the pendulums pursuing by putting their favorites on pedestals? Could it be that they are concerned for the personal achievements and well-beings of their adherents? It indeed not. Pendulums demonstrate the achievements of their favorites so that the majority of adherents are stimulated to serve them even more conscientiously. For how does your average Joe blogs become a star if not by hard work? Stars are the best of the best. Anyone can become a star, but they have to work really, really hard. The stars are a good example. Do what they do and you will be successful. The stars have unique abilities and qualities that the ordinary person does not have, which is all the more reason for them to be labor intensely if they want to be a success. So he's saying that that the, the pendulum's expression of stars is hard work and it's used to give more energy to the pendulum through hard, by using it as an example of hard work. But these are just the slogans the pendulums use. They do not deny the fact that anyone can be successful, but they do carefully hide the fact that everyone without exception has unique qualities and abilities. It would mean certain death for pendulums if every individual were to discover their own remarkable abilities. Wouldn't that be amazing if everybody became a star? If the adherents were to become free, escaping the control exerted over them, the pendulum would simply disintegrate. The pendulum is most comfortable when its adherents are thinking and acting in the same way. As you may remember from the second, from the earlier chapter we did on pendulums, very origin and survival depends on the uniformity of its adherents' thinking. The star's colorful individuality is supposedly an exception and serves to prove the rule by the very fact of being an exception the rule is do what I do this is why many young people fall into the pendulum's trap striving to be like their idols copying them and hanging up posters of them in their bedroom walls the mind blindly follows the pendulum thoughtless reason tells the heart that she is less than perfect as if by saying, even with my superb abilities, success is beyond me, so you have no chance. These people, now that's a different story. Look at them. We need to learn from them. Sit here quietly in your imperfection whilst I try as hard as I can to become their copy. The younger generation emulate their idols as if are trying to catch a hold of a mirage. The desire to emulate the success of others is the work of inner intention, like the fly beating itself against the window pane, one of his favorite examples. They are effectively attuning to a foreign sector of the field in which they would be nothing more than a parody. 
The mind can create various versions of a copy that will never astound anyone. A person becomes a star because of their willingness to be different and their unique individuality. The soul of every living being is inimitable in its own way. A unique soul has its own sector in the alternative space where its exceptional qualities can be manifest all in their magnificence. Check out my episode on finding your star sector where I talk about this in a little more depth. Every soul has its own individual star sector in the information field and he has that in italics and i'm fascinated by the star sector it is clear there may be an infinite number of star sectors so don't forget that there's not just one star sector there may be infinite numbers but for the purposes of the explanation we will conditionally assume that the individual soul has one unique sector of the field in the form of of an individual goal or path. Distracted by the lure of the pendulum, the mind will senselessly stagnate in someone else's star sector, trying to copy their qualities or repeat the script of their success. Copying someone else's script always creates a parody. The heart's potential can never fully be realized in a sector that does not belong to it. So how do you find your true sector? There is no need for the mind to worry about this because when left unhindered, the heart will find the path of self-expression. The mind's task is to forget about other people's experience, to acknowledge the heart's extraordinary nature, and to allow it to find its own path. Teenagers are particularly susceptible. I don't know if anybody out there has teenagers of their own, but I do. And I see it all the time, how susceptible they are to the influence of pendulums. Because they're still new to the world and do not yet know what to do or how to behave. It is easier more reliable and safer to mix in with the crowd, living life in the same way as everyone else rather than to stand out for any particular reason. The crowd instinct provides a feeling of security, but fundamentally severs the buds from the stem of individuality. You will have noticed how the majority of young people dress in the same style, use the same Vocabulary, ace, wicked, cool, and behave quite consistently with each other. Despite their superficial gloss of independence and autonomy, they submissively follow the pendulum's rule for do as I do. They believe they embody the modernism of the contemporary generation, but who among them would actually risk creating and valorizing the new? Among the teenage population, it is always the few that have given themselves permission to reveal the hidden qualities of the soul that become the leaders and the mavericks. It is these few who develop their own individuality that later become trendsetters, the ones to set the tone to create new movements and chase new opportunities and prospects. They do not copy other people or religiously obey the rules. They allow themselves to realize the distinct qualities of their own soul. Pendulums will not ordinarily put up with any expression of individuality, but in the case of the upcoming star, they are left with no choice but to accept them as a favorite. Then the next round of favorites is put on a pedestal and is spotlighted as new models for the adherent masses to worship. There is nothing wrong with a young boy wanting to be strong like his hero, or a girl wanting to be beautiful like her heroine. But they would not only copy them, or, for example, set themselves the task of building the same muscles, acquiring the same way of moving, talking, singing, or playing as someone else. The reason we like these people is because they have realized their own unique qualities right with their own sector of the alternative space. 
Of course, there should be some kind of initial role model that can serve as an example like a demonstration copy, but not as a yardstick or template to be emulated. Your yardstick is your soul. Simply allow it to explore all its qualities within your current sector. It is better to put a photograph of yourself on the wall and admire it than someone else's image. Loving yourself is extremely beneficial and constructive. Loving yourself leads to self-approval and is only punishable by balanced forces if accompanied by disregard for others. You really are a unique individual and in this sense no one compete with you. No one can compete with you. Just give yourself permission to be yourself. There can be no competitors to your personal uniqueness. Remember that you have a right to your own individuality and you will have a huge advantage over those who try to copy the experience of others. You will not get anywhere by striving to become like him or her. Become yourself. Allow yourself this luxury. While you wear... the mask of an existing star at most you will be a copy and at worst a parody stars do not become stars by copying other people when you give up on futile attempts to be like someone else everything will work out likewise when you cease futile attempts to repeat other people's scripts everything will work out when you acknowledge the brilliance of your own individuality, other people will have no option but to agree with you. Allow yourself to be presumptuous enough to have. All great actors play themselves. This might seem strange because the roles they play differ, but personality, character, and charm give an actor away immediately. The hardest role to play is the one where you play yourself and allow yourself to remove the mask and be yourself. It is much easier to play someone else because putting it on a mask is comparatively easy and the actor will have a professional skills to pull the role off. It is infinitely more difficult to remove the mask, but if you can take off the mask, what ensues is not role play, but what they call life on the stage. It only seems difficult, but in fact, Deciding to have is quite straightforward. All it requires is for you to shake off the stereotypes imposed by pendulums and once and for all claim belief in the infinite possibilities of your own soul. There is nothing pendulums can do to stop if you reject the experience of others and give yourself permission to be a star. All they can do is imbue you with oppressive thoughts like a star has to be beautiful and I'm not beautiful. A star has to be able to sing well, act and dance, but I cannot. A star has to have talent, which I do not have. I have not got what it takes. I'm better off watching how other people do it. Do take a good look at the stars of the pop science, sporting and business worlds. Many, if not all, fail to meet the perfect standards and expectations of what a star should look like. Every celebrity has their own bundle of flaws that could potentially eclipse their, pers their positive traits. For example, one star has a long nose, but people still think she is beautiful. Another star cannot sing, but people are mad about her songs. Another has no acting ability, and all the directors have sent her packing but she still climbed to the ranks of the celebrities. Another is short and fat, and you can only guess why the women love him so much. Another is a right nobody. Just what do people see in him? You look at another and he turns out to be really nondescript. You ask yourself, could he really be famous? Individuality does not fit with the rule, do as I do. But you will agree that individuality is an essential prerequisite for the birth of a star. So, a bright personality breaks the rule and pendulums have to acknowledge them as an exception, whilst the other stereotypes remain in force. All stars are exceptions. You too will become an exception from the conventional stereotypes. You can sing 
with a well-trained voice and languish in obscurity or sing terribly, but in your own curious manner and everyone will love it. You may boast brilliant intellectual abilities and never achieve anything, whilst the pathetic C pupil who is constantly harping on about his mad ideas in the end makes a brilliant discovery. You may have outstanding physical qualities but never become a sports star, whereas the one who dares to break the conventional stereotype leads the game on the field in an unexpected way and ends up the golden player. I will not continue the list of contradicted stereotypes. You understand the principle. Do not be afraid of breaking the pendulum's stereotypes and find the boldness to direct your mind's attention towards your own unique and inimitable soul. Watch out that you do not get caught up on another pendulum hook by being provoked into chasing after someone else's goal. This will only lead to disappointment. What good is another person's goal? Listen to your heart and not your mind. Your heart knows best of all where you can shine like a star. There's a law in the world of pendulums which is has it that only the occasional few may become a favorite and everyone else must fulfill the function of ordinary adherence and observe the rules of the system. Transurfing cannot get rid of this law, but it can help you personally to break away from it. Then, if you make the most of the unique qualities of your soul, the pendulums will be obliged to include you among its favorites. The next section is Guardian Angels. Many people believe that they have a guardian angel who helps them. Does anybody out there believe or have experiences with a guardian angel? If you believe that your thoughts create reality, then you may not have had a guardian angel before, but you can create one. I'm definitely going to have a meditation coming soon where it'll be creating our guardian angel for people who, who haven't really thought about that because it's pretty cool. If you believe in your personal guardian angel that is wonderful because it means that it exists, when you think about your guardian angel, turn to it with confidence and are grateful and you can be sure that these thoughts make your angel real. There is nothing that cannot exist in the alternative space. You may even believe that thoughts can create an independent informational energetic being if it pleases you to do so, the more sincerely you love your angel and express your gratitude for any small thing it helps you with, the stronger the little angel will become and the more it will support you. Ultimately, it does not really matter whether the angel exists independently or whether it is created by your thoughts. Reminds me of some great fiction books by Simon Green and... The whole idea is, and also Neil Gaiman's American Gods, the idea is that whatever attention you put towards, you create deities. You do. And if you watch American Gods, there's the TV gods. and There's real gods walking around because we've created them. So do you think that's possible? I certainly do. I'm not saying that, that American Gods is real, but I, I, can, I can tell you that there is more to this than you think, even if you're a strict non-believer in such things. Ultimately, it does not matter whether the angel exists independently or whether it cr is created by your thoughts. There is nothing wrong with not believing in guardian angels, so you do not have to. Do not feel if the, the, the need for guardian angel, you obviously feel comfortable and good about your life, which is great. In the end, you get what you believe in. Although, if I was you, I would believe in my guardian angel. What if guardian angels do exist, irrespective of whether you believe them or not? What if they love us and look after us as best they can, but we have forgotten them and turned away from them? The angel might need your love and be weakened by your lack of attention. Imagine the more love that you give it, it gives it like superpowers. 
It might be drained of energy and unable to assist its ward whilst you give your energy away left and right to destructive pendulums. Pendulums may also assist you, but only if it serves their interests. The well-being of a specific individual is of no consequence to pendulums at all, whereas you, guardian angel, takes care of you alone. Imagine your angel in any form, a cherub with wings, a fluffy cloud, a bird, whatever. It really doesn't matter how you see your angel for. If of itself it does not actually look like anything. It only takes a specific form within your imagination. So imagine your angel in the way that you find most comfortable. You can even identify it with your soul if you want to. People with extrasensory abilities can communicate with their angel. Do not worry if you're not one of these people. Your angel will find a way of setting you on the right path. It is important, and this is in italics, it is important not to take offense at your angel or even worse, get angry with it. Your angel knows what to protect you from and where to send you because in comparison to your angel, you are like a blind kitten. It is not for you to reproach your angel. You have no idea of the misfortunes your angel might be bending over backwards to protect you from. There is a parable about a man who meets with God in heaven. God is showing the man his entire life's path. And the man can see from the footprints that God has been walking beside him his entire life. Then the man noticed that in the bleakest periods of his life, there was only one set of footprints on the ground. The man turned to God reproachfully. Why, God, did you leave me at the times that were hardest to endure? To which God replied, You are mistaken. Those are not your footprints, but mine. In those most challenging moments, I carried you in my arms. You cannot overestimate the role of a guardian angel. Just the knowledge that there is another being who looks after and protects you as far as they are able helps to balance your confidence levels. Confidence, which generates inner calm, can play a huge role in a person's life. If you feel lonely, you can share your loneliness with your angel. Angels have yet another wonderful quality that you can benefit from. Your angel is not affected by the influence of of balanced forces. And that last part's in also in italics. Your angel is not affected by the influence of balanced forces. So I just really like to know everybody's opinion on guardian angels. Especially people that regularly listen to or watch the reality revolution. I would just love to know what you think. I've had some experiences that are just so crazy there's no way that I didn't have some sort of kind of protection. Uh, some mind-bending coincidences and crazy things that have happened there and I and I felt like I'd been guided but they can appear in different forms and so the angel that I met appeared like me so I would love to know what your opinion is and as he says they can look like they can look like anybody that you want when you create it and what does your guardian angel look like put that in the comments. I would love to see what you say about what your guardian angel would look like. So if you're pleased with your success, give yourself a slap on the back and be proud of yourself. This is a good thing. Somebody was asking me the other day that you couldn't be excited about your own success by yourself. And this is a line right here that shows you can be. It does not cause imbalanced forces. This is talking about how you deal with success. If you're pleased with your success, give yourself a slap on the back and be proud of yourself. This is a good thing. It is better to praise yourself too much than to be reproachful or self-critical. The only negative thing about being very pleased with yourself is that it can create excess potential, perhaps just a little, but enough 
and so balanced forces can end up spoiling your soul's celebration. <laughs> well, just as I got done saying that, you praise yourself and as a result you err or experience some unpleasantness. So does this mean that one should fear even a secret enjoyment of one's personal achievements? There is one way of taking joy and pride in one's triumphs without creating excess potential, which is to share your glee and satisfaction with your guardian angel. So this is something that I've been doing lately in reference to this chapter. Something really great happens and in the past I might I might have just said, you know, made a big deal about it, but I'll, I will just be like, thank you to my guardian angel. Um, and I think it works. You should try it. Share your glee and satisfaction with your guardian angel. Your angel took care of you and helped you get there. And so it deserves your praise and gratitude. When you are relishing in delight of a positive result and feel satisfied with yourself, remember your angel and delight in these moments together. Talk to your angel. Be unsparing in your praise and thanks. It is in fact better to praise your angel than to praise yourself. Have sincerity. Give away the gift of your right to reward wholeheartedly. You have nothing to lose because you have already received what is yours, leaving you free to thank and congratulate your angel. So what I'm, I'm saying here is, even if you don't believe in guardian angels and I know there's people listening to this that don't this can be a very effective form of mind you can almost call it a, a positive slide so that you can eliminate excess potential when you start to encounter great success you always see people get successful and then there's a counterbalance that occurs how do you ride that wave of sex success and keep on going and this is just a mind trick in many ways. Celebrate with your guardian angel to relieve and so that you don't feel like you're being overly braggadocious is I guess what you might say. If you're pleased with your success, give yourself a slap on the back and be proud of yourself. It, this is a good thing though. And he does say that. Your angel took care of you and helped you get there. And so it deserves your praise and gratitude. When you are relishing in the delight of a positive result and feel satisfied with yourself, remember your angel and delight in those moments together. Talk to your angel. Be unsparing in your praise and thanks. It is in fact better to praise your angel than to praise yourself. Have sincerity. Give away the gift of your right to reward wholeheartedly. You have nothing to lose because you have already received what is yours, leaving you free to thank and congratulate your angel. Consider your success to be the angel's merit. What will happen if you do? The excess potentials of your pride will be dissipated, and at the same time you can give up yourself the space to celebrate in your heart without caution. Feel the joy, but give the pride away to your angel, for obviously no one can take your achievement from you. Again, Zealand is concerned about balanced forces from being too prideful, and this is a way to eliminate that. It is better to give the reward and thanks to your angel than to create the excess potential associated with pride or express your gratitude to a pendulum that has bestowed a little joy upon you. Your angel needs your energy, but it will not ask you for it. If you think you have received help from a pendulum. There is no harm in thanking the pendulum too, but be aware that the pendulum will always automatically receive a portion of your energy because with a pendulum there is no such thing as free lunch ever. Whatever you do, do not neglect your angel. Remind your angel constantly that you love it and are grateful to it. It will become stronger as a result and reward you handsomely. So the next section is called a soul box. It's 
very metaphysical stuff and I love it your soul came into the world wide-eyed full of hope and trust but the pendulums promptly picked it up and assured that no one had been waiting to meet it no one was particularly pleased to see it and that it would be expected to do hard dirty work just to earn a small crust of bread of course not everyone is born into poverty but the wealthy have their problems too just of a different kind in the world of pendulums the wealthy suffer no less than the poor your soul did not come into the material world to suffer it just benefits the pendulums when the battle for a place in the Sun becomes the norm as you already know in accordance with the laws of informational and energetic matter a pendulum emerges from the shared thoughts and actions of a group of individuals and later carries on to exist independently of the group via the process of informational energetic exchange the pendulum compels adherence to its will and forces them to think and act in its own interests pendulums harvest human energy when emotions such as dissatisfaction irritation frustration anger worry and fear are expressed and when people they take in battles between other pendulums we are accustomed to living in a world of pendulums where oppression feud competition war and many other examples of rivalry are considered par for the course it does not occur to us that this might not be the normal and that things could easily be different look at the world from the point of view of the pendulum model if you remember all the many different manifestations of a pendulum's insatiable thirst for energy imagine what the world might be like if they didn't exist is it human nature he's not saying this I'm asking is it human nature for us to auto automatically create pendulums what if we early on learned about pendulums do you think we could stop them imagine what the world might be like if they did not exist if these types of informational energetic exchanges were not taking place there would be no structures that absorb the energy of others by drumming up rivalry it is difficult to imagine but in a world such as this there would be much happiness and very little suffering we could live in a world where there are enough natural resources and opportunities for everyone the idea has been instilled in us that the battle for survival and natural selection is an essential process that facilitates the evolution of life it is true that these processes do support the development of the world albeit of an aggressive kind however natural selection is not an essential condition for the growth of life life could equally as well develop in accordance with other more humane laws in the world of pendulums natural selection occurs according to a negative script by which the one who suffers loses their life which is in italics selection relies on the methods of oppression and destruction have you ever wondered whether there could be a different more positive script in which the one who feels well survives these two scripts differ only in as much as negativity differs from positivity one could argue that both scripts have a place in the context of natural selection but negativity is still the predominant factor the weakest one dies whatever the case may be the system that pendulums have established in the human world is far harsher than any system supported by nature the battle for survival as it occurs in in nature does not exhibit the same hardened and aggressive features that it does in the human world the pendulums people have created it are considerably more powerful and hostile than any of nature's pendulums just because in nature someone is always getting eaten does not mean that there is a constant war going on the lion feeds on the cow 
just as the cow eats the grass. Importance is a trait unique to human beings, because plants and animals have zero understanding of importance. The law of balance is maintained. It is only because man observes natural phenomena from a human belfry of importance that the normal coexistence of living organisms is perceived to be fierce struggle. Even animal kingdom rivalry over territory and mate is purely nominal in comparison to the constant warring of man. Animals very rarely inflict physical injury on each other unless they're hunting for prey. In the majority of cases, any conflict is decided in the best interests of the one that barks loudest and pulls the most intimidating grin and if blood should be drawn, it is most likely because paws cannot avoid being heavy. Emotions such as anger and hatred are not characteristic of animals. Neither do they show sings signs of courage or cowardliness. It all comes down to survival instinct. Daring wolves and timid rabbits only exist in our imagination. We cannot change the world. We have to accept that how the world is does not depend on us. Myriad limitations and conditioning literally stuff the soul into a box. The mind captured by convention becomes the soul's jailer prohibiting it from realizing its potential. The individual is simply forced to behave in the way the pendulum world demands to express dissatisfaction, to get irritated, to fear, to compete and fight. Human thinking and behavior is determined by reliance on the pendulum world. As you have already understood from previous chapters and episodes of the reality revolution, this type of conditioning drains a person's energy, sets balance forces against them, and distracts them from their true path, sending them out in a search of false objectives. To top it all, outer intention manages to realize our worst expectations. Most people would be happy to be free themselves of conditioning and dependency. They just do not know how to. Now you know that the pendulum's power relies on their adherence, importance, and lack of awareness. People are not usually aware they're, that they are reacting to provocation. They give in to worry, fear, and frustration automatically, expressing dissatisfaction and anger out of habit. They easily succumb to gloom and will exert maximum effort when met with obstacles. People live as if in a dream, complying with the script enforced by pendulums. They are oblivious to the fact that they can take control of the script, believing that very little depends on their own actions. Importance sucks people into the pendulum's game, and lack of awareness deprives them of their final chance to shape the script. The game is played by the pendulum's rules. As you can see, sometimes Zeeland repeats the same point several times. I think this is because although the insights set forth in his book seem obvious, the conventional pendulum constructed worldview is so deeply rooted in the human psyche. They can be difficult to feel and comprehend in their full depth and entirety. You can, however, break out of the box of conditioning if you follow the principles of transurfing. The power of the pendulum is great, but as long as you abandon importance, their power is insufficient to prevent you from consciously exercising your right to choose and write the scripts in your life. It is in the pendulum's interest to keep people under control so that they can pursue their own goals. To the pendulums, the individual is just an instrument, a means to an end, a puppet. 
your soul came into the world as to celebrate as a celebration so go ahead and give yourself permission to have this experience give yourself permission to have this experience only you can decide whether you want to spend your entire life working for the good of someone else's pendulum or living for your own enjoyment if you choose to live a life as a celebration it is essential that you free yourself from the pendulums that bind and seek out your own goal and your own doorway your mind has to understand that you do not owe destructive pendulums anything and are not obligated to do their bidding establish union between the heart and mind and you will have anything you could wish for literally and figuratively all you have to do is free yourself from pendulums and soften the discord that exists between your heart and mind allow yourself the luxury of deserving the best if someone tries to persuade you that you must work for the good of someone or something else to do not believe them if someone tries to prove to you that everything in life comes through hard work alone do not believe them if someone is imposing a harsh battle on you to secure your place in the Sun do not believe them if they try to tell you what your place is do not believe them if they try to tell you what your place is do not believe them if someone tries to draw you into a religious sect or community because you can make an essential contribution to the common goal do not believe them if they tell you that you have to live your entire life in poverty because that is how you were born do not believe them and if they tell you that you have limited options do not believe them you will soon see that pendulums will not leave you alone that easily now that you're aware of them as soon as shoots of your will to have to have begin to show themselves pendulums will create a situation designed to force you to accept that your options are limited the moment you feel strong enough to choose and determine the script yourself the pendulums will upset your plans so there's a question here that we're asking and that is do pendulums are they consciously aware when we are choosing our own scripts are there forces working against us when we have the ability and real realization and power to choose our own scripts I don't know I think that he's addressing this possibility and gives us a way through that as soon as you begin to feel calm and confident they will get their claws into you do not respond to provocation and do not let them shake you off balance keep the importance you attribute to things to a minimal level and to be conscious of your actions keeping importance at zero is what the situation calls for not massive effort and tenacity in this game the only limitation on your options is your personal intention and the only limitations that can be placed on the pendulum's options are your zero importance level and conscious awareness remember if I am empty there is nothing for the pendulum to hook into if I am aware of the meaning of the of the game pendulums will not be able to enforce their script on me if they still manage to disappoint you upset you or throw you off balance take a good look at where you have attributed inflated importance change your relationship to whatever threw you off balance in the first place try to be consciously aware of the fact that it is the pendulum and not you that is desperate for importance the box that inhibits your soul is made from the importance you attribute to things do not attribute excessive importance to anything you must simply take what is yours calmly and without insistence if it does not work do not make that important either the pendulums are wait just waiting 
for your spirits to fall. If something distresses you, make it seem less important. Be aware that it is just a game. And precisely that, a game and not a fight. For in essence, the pendulums are like clay goons. The game is harsh and relies on human weakness. The moment you give any slack to importance, you lose. If you keep importance at zero, the pendulums fall through your emptiness and the clay golem disintegrates. You will source strength and awareness that you understand the rules of the game. As soon as you notice that a pendulum is trying to hook into you and knock you off balance, have a chuckle to yourself and adamantly reduce the level of importance. Gradually, this will become a habit. And when it does, you will feel your strength and understand that you can determine the script yourself by winning the pendulum game you beget freedom of choice. So he makes a good point there. And just remember that if you don't know how to reduce importance, if you understand the concept of why importance can hurt, as we've talked about, it causes excess potential, balancing forces, you end up getting the opposite of what you want is humor and I think that Owen Hunt or Bootsy Greenwood is, is on to something when he talks about using humor to reduce importance. And I agree with him 100%. And, I, and something I've done, instead of listening to, to political news on, in my car or at any time when I normally would, I just turn it on. Netflix is a, is a joke radio or some comedy radio station or radio TV, sh- that I, whatever I can find that's funny if I have anything. And my goal when I drive is to laugh two or three times. And I noticed that by the time I, I get home, the importance of a lot of stuff has really diminished substantially. So try to get laughing into your life on a regular basis. I think it fuels waves of fortune and it's just one of those little secret hacks based on the reality transurfing model that's super easy to use and extremely successful. So jokes can be written in the comments as well. The next section is frail. And I've had some episodes on this, but it's good to go in depth, especially in this particular chapter. It's, I think, the first time that we've heard the word mentioned in the book. And there's a lot of confusion about what the frail is and how it works. So let's see what he says. Until now, we've been talking about how sectors of the alternative space have specific characteristics or parameters. For the sake of simplicity, we agreed to consider these characteristic frequencies. If when there is unity between heart and mind, the frequency of your thought energy corresponds to the frequency of a sector in the alternative space. The power of outer intention will facilitate your transition to that same sector. In other words, the scripts and scenery of the sector in question will become materialized in the layer of your physical world. The soul also has a unique range of parameters, which in the context of transurfing is referred to as frail. Again, for the sake of simplicity of the model, we will consider the soul's frail, its characteristic frequency. So you have a frequency, I have a frequency, and we're all like snowflakes, and our soul's frail is its characteristic frequency. Everyone's frail is unique like the structure of a snowflake, just as he says. No two are the same. The frail characterizes the unique and incomparable essence of a person's soul in italics. We can only guess at the form frail takes because it manifests implicitly hidden under the masks of the intellect, which every individual wears. For this reason, there would not be much point in going into this notion more deeply here. It is beyond doubt, however, that every individual has a unique soul essence. You can describe the character, habits, manner, and appearance of a person you know, and yet there will be something else beyond these characteristics, an integral image of that person that you understand without words. It is this individual essence that requires no explanation we call frail. You may have come across people who emanate an elusive and indefinable charm. 
Surprisingly, they may be relatively unattractive in their outward appearance, and yet as soon as they begin to speak, you immediately forget their physical shortcomings and are entirely spellbound. If somebody, for instance, could you imagine if somebody didn't know Jack Black, like had never seen him in the movies, or heard him sing, or he's just one of the funniest, coolest guys. If you saw that guy coming, say, hey, what's up, Jack, and you had never seen him, and how you would immediately change your mind about him. That is an example of what they're talking about. Once he starts talking, he's funny, you immediately forget. When asked wherein lies that person's charm, you can only mutter, there, there's something about them, finding no other explanation. Have you ever experienced this? You meet somebody and there's just that thing? Uh, it may not be a love attraction, just, just whatever it is, uh, um, they have that thing, that, that frail, that specific thing that you can't put into words. When asked wherein lies that person's charm, you can only mutter there is something about them. Finding no other explanation, such people are extremely rare. If there are none in your circle of acquaintance, look for them among the stars of show business. The hallmark of these personalities is the exceptional beauty and charm from seems to radiate from the depths of their soul. You'll immediately recognize that their beauty is different to a doll-like beauty, for a doll-like beauty is purely external and corresponds to conventional established standards. From the point of view of frail, the secret of this type of charming beauty lies not in the fact that a person has a beautiful heart or other spiritual quality. You will come to accept, or not as you wish, another paradox of the transurfing view. Beauty lies not in the heart or soul, but rather in the harmonious connection between heart and mind. No one has not yet learned to love themselves, who is self-critical, begrudges their work, lives in mental turmoil, or at odds with their own soul, can ever radiate the beauty of charm. Conflict between the heart and mind is reflected in a person's outward appearance and their character. If a person is happy and has learned to love themselves, if they enjoy life and do what they want to do, then they will exude a certain inner light which indicates that the mind is attuned to the soul's frail. Unity between heart and mind equates thought energy with the nature of outer intention. Self-fulfillment and a balanced relationship between heart and mind generate something very similar inner peace ignites an inner light that reminds the heart of its true nature, which is why the beauty of harmony is interpreted as charm or spiritual beauty. This kind of beauty sometimes evokes hidden envy and people ask, how come you look so radiant? The heart is not at peace when the mind is suffocating it in case, but when it is caressing the heart like a rose in an orangery, admiring and caring for it, allowing every petal to open freely. This is that rare thing we call happiness. Frail can manifest in the form of a hobby or other pursuit, and anything that is done with love and enthusiasm. Often, the strings of the frail rest silent for a long time. Sometimes a sign of some kind will cause a string to sound. It could be an unexpected passing moment that for some reason strikes a chord in your soul or something that you see that has a special magnetism that immediately draws you to it and you begin to sense a vague, perceptible urging over and over. This is your outer intention of your soul working. Interesting, the concept of the outer tension of the soul. But since it is vague yearning outer intention works without a specific aim it is important to listen to the it is important to li- listen to the dictates of your heart so that the mind can pick up on them when you catch hold of outer intention and quickly achieve your desire what prevents the mind from entering into a relationship with the heart once again importance is the problem along with our old friends the pendulums that install false aims and values As we said earlier, it is pendulums that set the standards of our notions of beauty, success, and abundance, and inner and outer importance 
that motivate the individual to compare themselves with these standards. Naturally, the mind finds a bundle of shortcomings and starts to hate itself and consequently the heart too. It tries on all sorts of masks to make the frail fit the standards. But as a rule, nothing good comes of it. As a result, the rift that exists between heart and mind widens. How then can there be any question of inner peace? The mind waters its rose with reproach and dissatisfaction and the rose becomes ever more feeble. The mind will search for treasure anywhere except its own heart. Pendulums tout loudly and seductively while the heart tries quietly and delicately to make its abilities and inclinations known. The mind does not listen to the heart and tries to change frail. Nothing, naturally, nothing good comes of this either. As a result, the heart and mind converge in their decision to negate these imaginary imperfections. Outer intention immediately transfers the individual to a lifeline where hostility intensifies because the imperfections have literally materialized. The mind assumes that if it wears a correcting mask, it will be able to meet the established standards. And as you know, this is fruitless. Like chasing after a mirage, rather than making the most of a frail's precious uniqueness, people beat against the window pane, chasing after its success of another. And yet the star's success is born from having attuned the mind to frail. The one hunting the mirage achieves nothing and is deeply dissatisfied with self. No one can ever reach a life where they accept themselves and feel fulfilled by expressing fundamental dissatisfaction with the self. The parameters of their energy field will simply correspond to lifelines where they have even more reason to feel unfulfilled. This is the game that pendulums inflict upon us. It appears senseless, but from the pendulum standpoint, the game has a very definite meaning. Dissatisfaction and lack of fulfillment are their favorite dishes. How can you attune the mind to the heart's frail? The only way is to convince the mind that above all the heart is worthy of love. You have to first love yourself and only then pay attention to the virtues of others. Love for the self should not be confused with self-satisfaction, vanity, or complacency. Complacent self-satisfaction comes from considering oneself superior to others and creates a dangerous excess potential. To love yourself means to understand your own uniqueness and accept yourself the way you are, warts and all. The love you have for yourself must be unconditional, otherwise it will turn into excess potential. Surely, you're worthy of your own love, for you are the only one there is of you. If a person has gone too far in the battle with their frail, it will be difficult for them just to up and love themselves. How can I love myself if I do not even like myself? And this is pure excess potential born of increased inner and outer importance. Outer importance lies in the fact that I take someone else's standards to be immutable truth. Perhaps I'm valuing the virtues of others too highly. Internal importance lies in the fact that I force myself to follow other people's standards. Who said that I'm any less than they are. I am just me. Could my self-esteem be too low? To learn to love yourself, shake outer importance off its pedestal and give up worshiping other people's standards. Who is stopping you from creating your own standards? Let others chase after your standards. Release inner importance and let yourself go. You are not obliged to follow or live up to other people's standards. You have to remain aware of the fact that the pendulum need importance, not you. When you love your heart with all your mind, outer intention will carry you to a lifeline where you'll be totally accepting of yourself. And if you like yourself no matter what, you will succeed in deceiving outer intention and reveal qualities you never suspected having. When your thought energy radiates at the frequency of self-acceptance and self-fulfillment, outer intention will pick you up and carry you on to lifelines 
where you really do have something to be proud of. One of the commandments says, love your neighbor as yourself. For some reason, everyone seems to focus on the necessity to love your neighbor, but the commandment presupposes that one already has love for themselves. Leave the game enforced by the pendulums and begin to love yourself. Starting today, buy yourself a favorite treat and have a personal party. Give yourself some tender loving care. Some may maliciously continue, indulge in all your weaknesses and bad habits, but this is the demagoguery of pendulums. And I see no reason why I should debate with them. You already know what it means to love the self. Weaknesses and bad habits are only induced by pendulums. There is no need to set out in search of the Holy Grail somewhere in the depths of the jungle. The Holy Grail is within you. It is the frail of your soul. The next section is the unity of heart and mind. The heart comes into the world trustingly reaching out with a child's arms. Then it discovers that pendulums have conquered the world and transformed it into a jungle. Pendulums immediately try and convince the heart that no one was expecting it, and that in this world everyone has to fight for a place under the sun and pay tribute to the pendulums. The naive direct heart must be put in its place straight away. The heart is told that no one is interested in her desires, that there is more suffering than happiness in the world, that holidays are only held on prearranged dates, and that it will have to work extremely hard just to earn a crust of bread. That is it. The heart is crestfallen. The eyes well up with tears of despair, or the heart is increasingly indignant. And that's not right. It's not fair. The hackles are up, and it looks as if the only choice is to plod dejectedly along a path enforced by pendulums, or scratch away desperately in an attempt to pursue one's own goals. The pendulums take hold of the mind on all levels, mental, emotional, and energetic. The conventional worldview and human behavioral responses are also shaped by pendulums. People think and act in a way that is advantageous to them. The heart, like the mind, also ends up in the conditioning box. There is an element of conditioning in the literally everything. People have to come to terms with the limitations placed on them and play their role in the game that has been forced upon them. In conditions such as these, the heart gradually retreats to the back burner whilst the mind takes the reins into its own hands. The mind counsels the heart as if it were a small, unreasonable child. I know better than you what needs to be done. Your foolish babble makes no sense. In the majority of people, the heart shrinks into a frightened, powerless creature that is left in the corner mournfully observing all the frantic mind gets up to. Sometimes moments of union between heart and mind occur. In these moments, the heart sings and the mind rubs its hands in satisfaction. But such moments are rare. More often than not, agreement between the heart and mind arises in moments of neg negation, fear, and hatred. The heart is given no voice in issues of choice. The mind treats the heart as if it were a child asking for a toy in the shop. The mind usually answers in the standard fashion that sounds, we cannot afford it, and with that the dream is instantly nipped in the bud. Look at what happens. The child needs the toy now. If you generally cannot afford to buy the child the toy, there is nothing wrong with refusing the child their desire, but the heart is willing to wait. And yet the mind places a crucifix on the entire situation and the conviction of an idiot. We do not have enough money. It turns out that the dream is fundamentally obtainable, unobtainable principle. The mind has a logic imposed by pendulums who gain from keeping adherence on a leash, denying them even of the freedom to choose their own dream. The heart has no logic and understands everything literally. The mind insists that there is not enough money, and yet the heart is not asking for money. It is asking for a toy, arguing that there is no money. The mind places a taboo on the toy. 
and the heart has nothing else except to close up inside and not mention the toy again. And the dream's funeral is over. The mind cannot see how to realize the dream, and so will not let it into the layer of physical life. For in life, everything should be logical and clear. The mind should have agreed to having the toy, and then outer intention would have taken care of how to find the money for it. However, the worldview constructed by pendulums does not allow for such miracles. That adherence should be have freedom of choice just does not fit with the pendulum's interests. People erroneously accept the rational worldview as an immutable law. The law, however, is a sham and can easily be de- deconstructed. Sometimes in life, little inexplicable miracles happen. So why not allow one of these miracles into your own life? All you have to do is allow yourself to have what the heart desires. If you brush away the web of prejudice and limitations the pendulums weave around us and genuinely believe that you deserve your dream and allow yourself to have what you desire, it will come to you. Allowing yourself to have is the most important condition for wishes to come true. The mind has other responses for the heart in the toy shop as well that sound, do not be silly. I know what you, what you need but better than you do. We are simple people. It is not possible. Not everyone can have these things. You do not have the right qualities or abilities. You can hardly compare yourself with him or her. Just live everyone, like everyone else does. If it were not for the impact of pendulums as a mitigating factor, one would accuse the mind of extreme stupidity. One can only hope that on reading these lines, it will wake up from its tenacious illusion and comprehend the absurdity of its reasonable arguments. Without the heart, the mind is not capable of very much at all. And yet together, the heart and mind are capable of almost anything because their merging generates the magical power of outer intention. The mind governs internal intention and the heart governs outer intention. Without help, the heart is not able to direct outer intention in a goal-oriented manner. And yet when the heart and mind merge, outer intention, which is, again, he's repeatedly saying outer intention, that's when when outside stuff starts changing around you. Outer intention becomes controllable and can be pursued in pursuit of specific goals. Everything that you think is unattainable is indeed impossible to achieve via internal intention, which is governed by the mind. No one is arguing against that. Whatever goal you set yourself, I agree that is would probably be hard to achieve within the limits of a rational worldview. And yet why should you walk away from your dream simply because some puffed up authority claimed the right to determine what is real and what is not? Why should you not claim your right to a personal miracle. The secret of happiness is just as straightforward as the secret of unhappiness. In both cases, it comes down to the unity or disunity between the heart and mind. The older a person gets, the greater the discord becomes. The mind succumbs to the influence of pendulums making the heart unhappy. In childhood, the heart still hopes that someone will give it the toy it wants to bad so badly, but with time, hope fades. The mind finds more and more confirmation that the dream is difficult to achieve and puts off realizing it until later. Usually the putting off till later lasts for a lifetime. Life comes to an end and the dream is stored away in a dusty box. In order to achieve unity between heart and mind, first of all one has to determine what exactly there should be agreement on i.e. identify one's goals. Despite seeming obvious, this question is not as trivial as it might first appear. As a rule, people know exactly what they do not want, but find it difficult to express their true desires. This can be explained by the fact that pendulums strive to subdue people enough to impose their own false goals upon them. There can be no question of unity of heart and mind if the mind is chasing after a seductive image and the heart longs for something else entirely. 
On top of that, people are so intensely busy and concerned with carrying out various types of work for pendulums that they have no time to simply sit quietly and consider their true desires. You have to deliberately set aside time and remember that your heart longed what your heart longed for in childhood. What did you like? What did you want? What is what really attracted you and what dreams did you have to give up over time? Ask yourself, does the goal from that distant past still attract you? Think about what you really want. Could it be a false goal? Do you really desire it with all your heart or do you just want to desire it? When you think about your goal, you must reduce inner and outer importance. If outer importance is heightened, the goal will appear seductively prestigious and unattainable. Are you sure you have not been caught on a pendulum's hook? If internal importance is heightened, you will think the goal is beyond your capabilities. And in this case, you will again be attracted to the goal because it appears unattainable. Do you really need it? When considering your goal, do not think about whether it is prestigious. Shake the goal from the pedestal of unattainability. This will reduce outer importance. Likewise, when you are thinking about your goal, do not think about how to achieve it. This will reduce internal importance. Only think about how comfortable you feel. Imagine how you would feel if you had already reached your goal. Do you genuinely feel good about it? Or is it like a heavy weight in your heart? Doubting whether your desired goal is realistic or not does not mean that it is not intent needed. The important thing is that your heart sings when you think about your innermost goal. However attractive something might appear to you, if it evokes a heavy feeling in your heart, the goal could be false. We will look at all these questions to more, in more detail in the next chapter. If you have no specific goal and do not desire anything in particular, you either have a weak life force or your mind has finally driven your heart into its box. In the first case, you can increase your vitality by looking after your health better. It might be that you do not truly know what good health is. When a person is in good health, life is pleasurable and they want to experience everything all at once. The heart is incapable of not wanting anything because for the heart, this life is a unique opportunity. In the second case, you can only have one option, which is to love yourself. Might you have gone a little overboard looking after everyone else? Put yourself first. You cannot do anyone any good. If your own heart has been pushed onto the back burner, you can waste your entire life sacrificing yourself to serve others, even if it is for the sake of those closest to you, to say nothing of pendulums. We are not given this life to serve others. We are given this life to realize our own individual potential. Shutting away your heart in a box creates powerful excess potential in the shape of a hidden lack of inner fulfillment, which will spill out in all kinds of trials and tribulations for yourself and those close to you. You will think you are doing good deeds, whereas in fact, from a wider perspective, all those good deeds are to the greater detriment. Look after yourself tenderly and attentively and enthusiastically, and then your soul will be warmed through and spread its wings. Do not believe anyone who tells you that you have to change yourself in order to be successful. No doubt you have heard such things. This is the pendulum's favorite recipe. Apparently, if something is not working, you have to work on yourself. What do the pendulums mean when they say that you should change? They mean turn away from yourself, face the pendulums and follow the rule, do as I do, in order to fulfill the demands and act in their interests. In order to change yourself, you have to struggle to overcome yourself. What question can there be of unity of heart and mind if you cannot accept or love yourself and are in conflict with your inner self? The soul will not accept false aims. It has its own inclinations and needs when you are when you work towards false goals, you either end up achieving nothing or when you arrive at your destination, you finally understand that it, what it, not where you were wanted to be after all. 
Transurfing has no relationship to the pendulums and so recommends a completely different path. Do not change yourself. Accept yourself. Turn away from the husks the pendulums impose and lure the mind's attention towards your heart. Listen to the dictates of the heart consciously reducing importance as you go and allow yourself to have and you will receive anything your heart desires. To bring your heart and mind to unity, you have to pay attention more often to your level of inner peace. You feel comfortable, calm, and at peace when nothing is wrong, worrying you or getting you down. Inner, in, inner tension signals the opposite. You feel uneasy, oppressed, afraid. You feel down or something is weighing on you. If there are, are the feelings that arise and you know what is causing them, then the tension begins in the mind. As a rule, the mind knows what is frightening, worrying, or, or oppressing it, and so you can rely on the mind to find a solution. The heart's tension is a little more complicated because the discomfort is manifest furtively as a vague pre presentiment. The mind will insist that everything is fine, that everything is going as it should, and there is no need for concern. And yet, despite all these reasonable arguments, you know that something is getting you down. This is the rustle of the morning stars. It is not difficult to hear the voice of the heart. The task lies simply in paying more attention to it. The mind, with its logical reasoning, sounds too loudly for the individual to attach any meaning to a vague and elusive presentiment, absorbed in its own logical analysis and prognosis of events the mind simply is not in the mood to listen to the feelings of the heart. There is no other way of learning how to listen to the rustle of the morning stars than to develop the habit of paying attention to your level of inner peace. Every time you have to make a decision, first listen to the voice of reason and then the feelings of the heart. As soon as the mind has made a decision, the heart will react to it either positively or negatively. In the case of the latter, you will experience a vague feeling of inner tension. If you forget to pay attention to your level of inner peace until it is too late and remember in retrospect which feelings the decision evoked, you will have experienced a fleeting feeling precisely at the moment the decision was made. In this moment, the mind was so involved in analyzing the situation that it was too busy to take note of any whispering from the heart. Now try and remember what the first fleeting feeling felt like. If it was an oppressive feeling on the background of the mind's optimistic reasoning, this is the heart's way of saying no. To what extent can you trust the presentiments of the heart? If you have experienced a premonition of a particular event that is going to happen, it is not advisable to place too much trust in these feelings. There's no guarantee that the mind will correctly interpret the information the heart is providing. Only a feeling of inner tension in response to a decision made by the mind can serve as a reliable guideline. Now that's in... in italics so only a feeling of inner tension in response to a decision made by the mind can serve as a reliable guideline a feeling of inner peace however is not necessarily a guarantee that the heart is saying yes it might be that the heart simply has no particular response to your decision yet when the heart says no you will feel it distinctively as you know from the material in previous episodes the soul is capable of seeing sectors in the alternative space that will be transformed into physical reality as a result of an intellectual decision being put into action. When the heart sees the result, it will express its response to it as positive or negative. You will know from your own experience that, the, that when the heart says no, it's always right. You know how the reliable criteria of inner tension as a way of determining the truth when you have to make a decision if the heart says no and the mind says yes, boldly refuse, if at all possible. The heart is not capable of desiring anything bad. 
If, however, the mind still insists that we have to act as best you can in the circumstances, sometimes in life we do have to accept the inevitable. In any case, the criteria of inner tension will help bring clarity and certainty to the situation where the scales fluctuate. Once you have achieved unity of heart and mind on the issue of your chosen goals, the next step is to attain unity in the decision to have an act. Internal intention of the mind has to merge with outer intention of the heart. If, If you act within the framework of internal intention at the same time as directing outer intention in the necessary direction, you can consider that the goal is in the bag. If you are uncertain of the internal intention because you cannot see clearly how to achieve the goal, work on the de- intention. Work on the decision to have outer intention is much stronger than internal intention and you will find a way. You have to achieve the same unity of heart and mind over the decision to have that is present when you experience powerful emotions. The heart and mind are usually united in strong feelings such as adoration, hostility, fear, and our worst expectations. We love, hate, and fear with all our heart. When the heart and mind are united, a passionate feeling is born. As the famous Russian writer Nikolai Chernivsky said, the one who does not know how to hate will never learn to love. If the goal is chosen correctly, the heart and mind will both be satisfied. The feeling of pleasure that arises can only be marred by thoughts of how inaccessible the goal seems, or if the goal is beyond the person's individual comfort zone. Slides can help correct the situation if the mind doubts the potential reality of the goal and the heart feels bashful in the director's chair. You already know how slides work. By widening the limits of your comfort zone, you will achieve the passionate joy of unity in which the heart sings and the mind rubs its hands in glee. I repeat, when considering your goal, don't think about how prestigious it is or how achievable it is or how exactly you might achieve it. The only thing you should pay attention to is how comfortable it makes you feel. Does thinking about it make you feel good or bad? This is the only thing that matters. Otherwise, you may end up confusing feelings of inhibition with feelings of inner tension. When faced with challenging or unfamiliar situation, it is natural to experience some reluctance, inhibition, or shyness. You may wonder, can all this really be for me? Whereas gut feelings and inner tension are associated with dejection, chore, oppressive responsibility, despondency, apprehension, and painful anxiety. If creating slides does not ease feelings of inhibition, then what are you experiencing is clearly a negative gut feeling of inner tension. In this case, you should be totally honest with yourself and decide whether the goal really is that essential after all. Now, the next section is soundbite slides where we talk about the transurfing version of affirmations. And this is good stuff to know. Obviously, this is a long chapter, but we're getting closer. Sound bite slides. Human perception can be divided into three main types auditory, visual, and kinetic. Or kinesthetic, I think is what he actually meant. Some people can better operate with visual images, others are more sensitive to sensation, and the third group is particularly receptive to sound. So we're seeing here that transurfing agrees with the fundamental model of neurolinguistic programming that human perception is divided into main different types. Until now, we have talked about creating slides with a preference for visual and sensory objects. Some spiritual development practices use positive affirmations, which involve a person repeating their goal as a positive statement many times over in their mind. For example, I have perfect health, a powerful energy field, and inner peace. I am calm and confident. Multiple repetitions of phrases like this spoken aloud or silently are most suited to people with auditory perception. However, there is no such thing as an absolute type, so anyone can use the positive affirmation technique successfully. Affirmations work in the same way as slides, but when you use a positive affirmation, 
You have to take into account the differences between the language of the heart and the language of the mind. Firstly, the heart does not understand words. And so mindless repetition will have no effect on it. The heart only understands feeling and thoughts which go beyond words. Words can be used to stimulate thoughts and feelings to a certain degree, but they are not as efficient because speech is a secondary medium. It is more effective to feel something once than to repeat it a thousand times in words. Strive to experience the feeling and repeat the affirmation simultaneously. Secondly, each affirmation should have a narrow focus. There is no point in grouping several goals together in the same affirmations. For example, the affirmation cited above would seem to have great content because it includes everything you might need in life, but you will not be able to evoke the whole set of associated sensations when you are repeating the affirmation. Third, avoid humdrum, monotony, and uniformity. Every new series of repetitions should be accompanied by fresh elements of feeling and experience. For example, if you consistently repeat to yourself, I am calm and confident, these words will very soon lose their meaning. Desire has to be nurtured and persuaded. Intention, on the other hand, acts instantly with confidence, appearing in the moment of your intention to be confident. Therefore, if you want to be confident, be confident with intent. Finally, there is no point in creating an affirmation that fights against an effect without first eliminating the cause. For example, there is no point in repeating, I have nothing to fear and nothing to be worried about if the cause for concern is still present in your life. Moreover, affirmations should be designed to have a positive note instead of endlessly repeating what you would like to avoid. Program yourself to the result you wish to achieve, for example, that I am not afraid or concerned would be more effective with a positive affirmation such as everything is working out well for me. Be specific about what would have to be going well for you to have no cause for a concern as a result. Note also that you should say everything is working out fine and not everything will work out fine. If you write the affirmation using future tense, The future will never become the present, being simply transformed into an oasis just ahead of you. You have set the parameters of your energy if you already have the thing you are ordering. Neither is there any point in ordering inner peace. Inner peace results from a harmonious connection between heart and mind on a specific issue. Harmony cannot be achieved as a general principle by abstract auto-suggestion. The heart can however be taught and soothed with the help of a slide affirmations work most effectively when you're in a zero emotion state when there is no excess potential the subconscious cannot be persuaded instructed or ordered to do anything as soon as you switch on any emotion you destroy the balance if you try to beat a thought into your brain your heart will simply stick its fingers in its ears and ignore you An affirmation is most effective when it is repeated dispassionately in a related state. Then perhaps your mind will get through to your subconscious. If the mind has to desperately try and convince the heart of something, it means the mind does not really believe it either and no amount of repetition will dispel its doubts. Nothing can be achieved by the mind pressuring the heart. Neither can you generate will to have with intent when you are riding an emotional high. The things that belong to you seem uh, mundane and you take them for granted. You handle things that are yours calmly without insistence in the same manner that you take letters out of the post office box. If you mistake assertiveness for will and the intent to have, you will end up spinning circles on the spot and taking a pendulum by the hand. Before you have time to blink, the pendulum will let go of your hand and send you sliding ahead long into the pit of your former indecision. When your will to have with intent is free of your desire to have, the pendulums will have nothing to hook you into. As you can see, an affirmation represents a kind of sound slide. You can use affirmations and film slides And of course, they are additionally effective when integrated into the same practice. 
Here it is, is an example of an integrated slide. It contains a picture of your new home. You're sitting beside an open fire in a creaking, rocking chair with the logs in the fire happily spitting and crackling away. It is so nice to sit and watch the fire. You can hear the sound of the rain outside where cold wind blows, but you're well, warm and cozy beside the fire. You have your favorite treat on a small table beside you, and there is an interesting film on the television. You see, hear, and sense the whole scene. And you say to yourself, I feel comfortable. You're not simply watching the side you're living in. The next section is a window onto the alternative space. People always have controlled and uncontrolled thoughts running through their mind. Some people refer to this as the inner dialogue, but in essence... It is not a dialogue but a monologue because the mind really has no one else to chat to aside from itself. The heart is not capable of thinking and talking. It only feels and knows. The inner dialogue is loud in comparison to the silent sensation of the heart. And so intuition manifests itself very rarely and is barely noticeable. Some people believe that if you can quiet the inner monologue, the mind will give you access to intuitive information. This is true, but it is not possible to switch the monologue off totally when you are in a conscious state. Imagine that you are concentrated on being still and have managed to relax the flow of thoughts and words. You may have no apparent thoughts experiencing the emptiness within, but this does not mean that the monologue has been silenced. The mind is not asleep. Quite the opposite, in fact. It is very alert because its task has changed. It must not think or chatter. It is as if the mind is saying, Okay, I'll be quiet. We'll see how you get along without me. That the monologue appears to have been silenced is an illusion. The inner monologue can only be truly quieted when the mind relinquishes its control or at least relaxes its vigilance. When the monologue only appears to have been stopped, the mind is still on the lookout and you could say drowns out the feelings of the heart even more than its very def- deafening silence. When the mind really surrenders its control, your perception falls through into the alternative space. The inner monologue is only truly muted when you're sleeping or experiencing deep meditation. This is only has practical benefit if a person practices lucid dreaming or deep meditation in which a state of consciousness is maintained. Lucid dreaming can be used as an experimental way of training the skill of outer intention, but what about in waking? Can you silence your inner dialogue when you're in a conscious state? Fortunately, there is a loophole. In moments when the mind gives some slack on its control of a narrow window spontaneously opens, and through it the intuitive feelings of the heart erupt into consciousness. Intuition is felt as a vague presage, also called the inner voice. In moments when the mind is distracted, it is easy to intuit the feelings and knowledge of the heart, to hear the rustle of the morning stars. The voice without words, meditation without thought, and sound without volume. In these moments, you begin to get a sense of something, but it still has an elusive quality to it. Do not think, feel intuitively. Everyone has experienced the thing we call intuition at some time or another in their life. For example, you get the feeling that someone is about to arrive. You sense that something is about to happen. You have no unconscious urge to do something or realize that there is something. You just know. In the game of thinking, the referee is the mind's analytical apparatus. The mind quickly sorts any data it receives onto shelves reserved for different signs to make everything logical and rational. Silencing the inner monologue is like confiscating the referee's whistle and making him sit out the game on the reserve's bench. The mind continues to observe but is incapable of controlling the game. The mind occasionally takes short breaks from juggling data as if for a brief moment sitting down on the bench for a rest. During these breaks, The window opens to intuitive information. In these moments, you fall asleep. This may be news to you, but this really is how it all works. Everyone falls asleep during the day 
several times. It is just they are not aware of doing it because the window is open for a very brief instant. The dozing mind wakes up and continues with its monologue. Sometimes an impression of what was glimpsed through the window reaches the conscious mind in the form of intuitive information. But more often than not, the mind pays no attention to it. These brief visions, because it is so engrossed in its own thoughts. In sleep, the soul can travel anywhere and flies about purposely. But when the window opens during waking, the heart specifically sees the sector of the alternative space that the backgrounds the mind current thoughts. So the soul's gaze is directed towards the corresponding sector of the alternative space where it sees knowledge related to the mind's current thought content. As soon as the window opens, this knowledge breaks through to the consciousness. If on waking the mind pays attention to an impressions of the soul, remembers the short burst that took place during sleep, it will receive what is called intuitive knowledge, information that comes as if from out of nowhere, as if pulled out of a hat. An intuitive revelation is sometimes claimed to be a spontaneous flash of mental insight or a solution that suddenly falls into the mind as if out of a hat. As well as a solution The mind comes to its own accord, so where exactly does the knowledge out of nowhere come from? In conventional worldview, people usually close their eyes to this strange type of occurrence and make allowances for it, accepting it as a quirky feature of the mind. Based on the transurfing model, we can see that inspiration works quite differently to the explanations people usually come up with. The mind finds a solution to the problem via logical inference. Revelation, i.e. the missing link that cannot be attained from the existing chain of logic, comes from the alternative space to the medium of the heart. The subtle feelings of the heart are manifest as anxiety and depression or excitement and high emotion. All these feelings can be covered by one term, vexation. It is as if the heart is striving to communicate something to the mind, but cannot quite explain what it wants to say. Lingering anxiety, guilt, the burden of responsibility, and depression can become transformed into physical reality in the shape of our worst expectations. In all these feelings, there is unity of heart and mind. Our worst expectations become a reality due to outer intention. We know that misfortune never comes alone. With those energy parameters, we shift onto the worst lifelines where misfortune has no chance of getting lonely. Sometimes an induced shift shoves us onto a run of bad luck that takes us a long time to free ourselves from. You'll notice that when you experience this state of lingering anxiety, your worst expectations are immediately realized. Outer intention moves you on to successful lifelines where the situation escalates before your very eyes. The heart actually helps to materialize the misfortune it has foreseen because it unified with the mind over its worst expectations. You can turn outer intention to your advantage by establishing unity of heart and mind on the question of your best expectation. Transurfing recommends abandoning importance and negativity and consciously directing your thought energy towards the achievement of your goal. As you are already aware, the conscious use of slides can help attune your thought energy and the same technique can be applied when the window opens as long as you can catch the moment. Intuitive knowledge and premonitions come to us spontaneously. When this happens, the mind uses the heart's capacity for premonition in standby mode. It simply receives information from the sector the soul has randomly wandered into. So our task is to learn to generate intuitive premonitions intentionally in order to set the heart's sail in the right direction. How is this done? Rather than simply being unintuited, The premonition must be intentionally induced. You have to seize the moment when the mind is distracted and quickly place a slide in the window. The image must contain the feelings you experience from living inside the slide. 
When you place a slide in the open window, information is deliberately in, dispatched on, into the target sector of the alternative space as opposed to being received randomly from the heart. If you manage to insert the slide in the open window, your mind will have touched on outer intention. You might think that you can create the same effect by running a slide lying in bed before you fall asleep. You would think that the slide would gradually slip into a dream and the heart and mind would be united, yet as strange as it may seem, this approach does not work. Zeeland will explain why in the next section. Before he does, see if you can answer this question. Why is there no point in trying to run a slide in your sleep? So the next section is the frame. And I included the idea of the frame in my last meditation, visualizing the target slide as an add-on, because I really love the idea of using the frame. Uh, when you're, It's a quick way of doing quick me- um, um, visualizations, and it's, it's very good way of looking at it a transitional zone exists between the moment in which we all have an intuitive premonition of an event and the actual event as it is shaped by outer intention in other words when you intuitively sense that a certain event is going to happen your thoughts brush across it without thinking then ordinarily the event is later materialized particularly if the mind agrees with the heart's premonition It makes you wonder whether you simply had a premonition that the event was going to happen or whether your subconscious thoughts actually induced the event working in a similar way to outer intention. There's no unequivocal answer to to which serves as an original cause, but the explanation to have their place. In dreams, everything is much clearer. You barely have to think or rather sense that an event will develop in a particular way and the scenario is realized instantly. During sleep, outer intention works flawlessly. So where does, the, where does that leave us? It leaves us with just that. We see the realization of a foreseen scenario in a dream. But dreaming has no impact on material reality. Virtual reality remains just that, virtual. So why does not outer intention materialize a virtual sector as a result of our dreaming? You might think... That is because of inner quality of material realization. Dreaming in comparison to physical reality is as a paper boat to a large frigate. The paper boat flies off at the slightest whiff of outer intention, whereas only a large sail an extended period of time will shift a heavy frigate along. Yet, inertness is not the reason why outer intention does not transform virtual sectors into physical reality as a result of your dreams. You can run your slide as much as you like, even in lucid dreaming, but it will not bring you a single step closer to your goal. The thing is that in dreaming, outer intention only has one function, which is to carry the soul from one sector to another. This is how it works in dreaming. The mind sets the rudder of the heart's sail in line with the expectation. Outer intention instantly shifts the paper boat to the corresponding sector, and with that it is done. The mission of outer intention is complete. In physical reality, the work of outer intention can never be complete with one small puff the wind of intention blows but the frigates is unmoved if there is unity of heart and mind the sail will adopt the necessary position the size of the sail depends on the power of unity that exists the wind cannot instantly shift the frigate to the necessary sector the qualities of a person's thought energy may already correspond to the target sector, but material realization lags behind in the previous sector. In order for the target sector to be realized, the wind of intention has to work for much longer. The outer intention that works in a dreaming has no chance of shifting a frigate for the simple reason that the frigate's sail has been taken down, leaving just the small rudder of a paper boat to do its work. The wind of intention can propel the boat of dreaming, but its capacity for material realization is powerless to work on a frigate. This is why running a slide in your sleep will not help the process of material realization. The heart sail is sufficient to power flight around virtual space, but it's totally different to the kind of movement that occurs in material realization. In lucid dreaming, the slide's only function is to widen your comfort zone And this is enough. If you practice lucid dreaming, the slide can be an excellent way of widening the limits of your comfort zone in your sleep. In waking before your conscious and subconscious mind are firmly anchored in the material world, the mind keeps the heart clearly focused on the sector of material realization. 
As we showed earlier, the mind is constantly correcting its perception to fit in with the established template. By running the slide in waking, you attune your thought energy to an unrealized sector of the information field. Depending on the strength of connection between heart and mind, the sail fills up with the wind of an outer intention and the frigate begins to move slowly but surely towards the target sector. Outer intention will continue to do its work until such time as material realization reaches its destination. Can you see the difference? In dreaming, the work of outer intention culminates quickly, whereas in waking, it continues over time. In dreaming, the parameters of thought energy and targeted sector correspond instantly and with that the job is done where as in waking the process is slow and gradual when you run the slide in waking the frigate sail of material realization is set and outer intention works on moving the pair of powerful frigate rather than the little boat of the dreaming realm you must not be put off by my bold use of such simple metaphors to describe these complex processes they help to convey the essence of things more clearly, and in any case, there are no other analogies in the mind's list of symbols that would be more apt. When the mind has momentarily switched off, and the window opens onto the alternative space, the focus of one's perception remains within the context of the current sector that has been realized materially. Unlike in ordinary dreaming, through the window, the frigate's sail is still up. If in this instant you place a side through the window, a gust of wind of intention will propel material realization a considerable distance. The window is so effective because in this moment the connection between heart and mind is at its strongest. The dozing mind relaxes its control and allows something unreal into its perception template just as it does in dreaming. As a result, the sail takes on significant proportions and outer intention acts with greater force. This technique is more complex than the others we have introduced, but that is not stopping you from giving it a go. Start by giving consistent attention to your intuition and observing the self. Then you will realize that during the course of the day, the window opens quite often. From time to time, the mind gets tired of control and chatter and loses its concentration just for a few moments. This is the time to deliberately insert the feelings associated with the event you want to induce. It has to be the feelings specifically rather than expression of those feelings and words. So I'm saying from this that if you're going to meditate, that's a really good time to introduce the slide. You can get yourself to mind your mind to drift. And this, to me, this passage here is a real endorsement on meditation. But you do not have to meditate. You just your mind needs to let go. Imagine how you would feel if the imagined event had already been streamed into physical reality. Run the slide over in your mind, picturing the fulfillment of the goal, and take one integral exposure a frame from it. One frame. For example, you sign a contract and feel contented, or you pass an exam and the teacher shakes your hand, or you win the race and you push your chest out through the duct tape as the finish line. This exposure is the formula you need to insert into the open window. You can give the frame a one-word title such as victory, yes, I did it, or anything else you prefer. This title just serves a reference point for the frame. And I do this all the time, driving, hanging out, watching TV, bam, just throw the frame up. Some people find this a lot easier than prolonged visualizations, and it can still be very effective. So I totally recommend it. We all have random chatter. Start to control your random chatter by using frames. It is difficult to catch the moment when the window opens because your mind is involved. Even though it is dozing, which means that as you set about inserting the frame, the mind will wake up and the window will be instantly slammed shut. With time, you'll get the knack for it. The important thing is to be patient and keep your intention strong. First, your mind has to develop a frame for the feeling associated with the material realization of your goal event. The mind should actively participate in the development of the slide. Then, without yet trying to catch the open window, turn the slide over in your mind to get a clear sense of the final feeling associated with the event. Create a hook for this integral feeling. Then you'll be ready to 
deftly insert the frame from the moment the window opens. Ideally, the dozing mind becomes aware of its sleeping condition and immediately throws the frame through the window before it has time to come to fully. This is how outer intention works when the mind has silenced its inner monologue. Repeated attempts, even if they are at first unsuccessful, gradually become habit-making. It is easier for your mind to instinctively throw the frame through the window. The point of having the frame is that the mind can activate it rapidly and automatically before fully waking up. If you find the frame technique very difficult to work with, do not worry. Leaving it for the time being, the frame technique is described here more for the sake of information than anything else. If it does not work for you straight away, maybe the technique is not for you. Focus on the standard slides and practice the visualization process instead. In any case, it is very useful to acquire the habit of being attentive to the window. If you can learn to catch open window moments, you'll begin to have intuitive insights more often. So here's a summary of this chapter and boy, oh boy, I'm sorry that it's been so long. You can listen to this in three or four parts. You can listen to me at three times speed. I recommend it. It's how I listen to myself. But in summary, the mind has will, but it's incapable of feeling outer intention, the power of the outside world. I almost believe that when he says outer intention, he's saying God. The mind has will, but incapable of feeling God. The heart can feel God, but it is not capable of will. So the heart can feel outer intention, but is not capable of will. When heart and mind are united, they harness the will of outer intention. Your heart is just as good as the heart of others. You deserve the absolute best. You have everything that you need. All you have to do is use it. And stars are born independently, but pendulums light them up. Pendulums hide the fact that every individual has unique abilities. The rule is do as I do creates the pendulum's widely accepted stereotypes. Every soul has its own individual star sector. If the mind allows it to, the heart will find its sector. Allow yourself the boldness to sneeze at stereotypes and allow yourself the boldness to believe in the unlimited capabilities of your soul. Allow yourself the boldness to exercise the right to your own amazing individuality. Keep the joy and give the pride to your angel. Human thought and behavior is conditioned by dependency on pendulums. Keep importance to a minimum and act with conscious awareness. Do not attribute anything excessively meaning. Do not send, do not need importance, pendulums do. You do not need importance. It is not effort and steadfastness, but conscious intention that keeps importance at zero. Frail characterizes the individual essence of the human soul. In chasing after other people's standards, the mind becomes all the more divorced from the heart. You will acquire many hidden virtues by attuning your mind to the soul's frail. In a state of unity, the heart sings and the mind rubs its hands in satisfaction. Focusing on the means, the mind places a fatal cross on the elusive goal. Allowing yourself to have is the most important condition to fulfilling your desires. Despite all its attractiveness, if something weighs on you, the goal may be false. Never believe anyone who expects you to change yourself. Inner discomfort manifests as heavy anxiety, a feeling of being burdened and oppression. A feeling of inner comfort does not signal an unequivocal yes. A feeling of inner discomfort signals an unequivocal no. So if you're feeling good, that does not necessarily mean it's good. But definitely pay attention when your heart is saying no. When considering your goal, do not think about how prestigious or realistic it is. Do not think about the means to achieving it. Give your attention to how comfortable thinking about it makes you feel. Any affirmation should be accompanied by corresponding feelings, and every affirmation should be positive and have a narrow focus. Focus the affirmation on the cause, not the effect 
formulate the affirmation in the present tense when the will to have is free of the desire to have the pendulum has nothing to hook into and finally you calmly take what is yours without insistence just like you take a letter from your letterbox it's a massive chapter and we've covered so many things we've covered the wind of intention the heart sail the wizard within the mirage of what we actually go for and the guardians angels the soul's box the idea of the frail and how to tune into the soul the unity of the heart and mind we discussed sound bite slides and a window onto the alternative space using frames all of this is going to lead to a pretty fantastic meditation probably pretty similar to some of the ones we've done before but i think it would be good to really dedicate some time just to unifying the heart and mind not just in a in a little statement for 30 seconds or a minute but really dedicate some time um i think that all of this stuff is fascinating and the way that he writes is very powerful it just feels right it feels true as when people say this is particular chapter that carries some unique wisdom and when you hear it it feels like you already knew this and the reason you already know this is that it's true but i'd love to get your comments and ideas and thoughts of what i i can include in in the meditation and it's always a joy if you shared this with me i learned so much in reading this out loud on this podcast it seems like i learned more than when i read it the first time and it's wonderful to share it with you and i would love to talk about this stuff so check out all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. For coaching, go to my website, advancedsuccessinstitute.com. Keep an eye out for my book that is coming soon, The Reality Revolution, The Mind-Blowing Movement to Hack Your Reality. It is always a joy. It is always so much fun to do this because I feel like uh, you guys enhance me when I do it and I feel a rush of energy. So I really enjoy doing this. So thank you so much. Let me know if you have any questions. Email me at media at advancedsuccessinstitute.com. And may you go on and have a super fantastic day. And may your heart and mind be unified. Incredible things are on the horizon for you. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.